Thank you very much for being here this evening. This promises to be an engaging conversation amongst four panelists. And one hopes that we can have a constructive dialogue on an issue which uh, evokes strong responses. Is the defamation of the right working for the left? Inbuilt into this question is a position. And many people will say that it is wrong to begin a debate with a pre-assumed position. But if you were to look at the history of politics and the way it has been articulated, it almost always appears that the right has no intellectuals in its midst and that they are full of fascists or people sympathetic to the Hitlerian worldview from those that are its political practitioners to its ideologues. It's an interesting characterization and one that we can engage with and see whether A, it is justified and B, if it was in some sense rather patronizing. Let me begin this uh, evening with an ideologue to the left of me, Mr. Sudhindra Kulkarni. Mr. Kulkarni, you have been, of course, associated with the NDA-1 in an extensive way. You knew Mr. L.K. Advani very well. You knew Mr. Vajpayee very well. Even at that time, would you agree that the conversation around the right was sort of patronizing practitioners, whether they were activists of political parties that espoused a worldview that coincided with what is loosely described in this country as cultural nationalism were thought to be vandals, their dulls were full of reactionaries? Or are we seeing something different here? Because I see it as a continuum. But here we have a situation where many people think that this is only particular to NDA 2 or 2.0. Thank you, Rahulji, for inviting me. <clears throat> I find myself in a very peculiar position in this debate. As I walked in, I was going to sit there. And he said, no, you sit here. So you made me sit on the left, assuming that I am on the left. Now, what is peculiar about me is that in my long political career, I have been with the left. I was part of Mohammed Salim's party, CPIM, and I've also been with the right, the BJP. For a long time, 16 years, I was with the BJP, I was with Vajpayeeji, Advaniji. So there is a lot of left in me, and there's also a lot of right in me. And I'm grateful to both. I'm grateful to the left, I'm grateful to the right, because I believe that India needs both what is good in left and what is good in right. And I have never believed in demonization of the right by the left or of the left by the right. This has done a lot of harm to the intellectual discourse in India and to politics in India. And it has come in the way of politics of cooperation, politics of consensus building for what is good for India. Now, let me give an example of how, when I was in the BJP, we didn't have this uh, demonization of the left by the right. You know, unfortunately, the left has demonized right, and right is now demonizing the left. Hmm? I'll give an example. On the 19th of March, 1998, the BJP leading the National Democratic Alliance, NDA1, came to power. In the morning, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee was sworn in, his cabinet was sworn in, L.K. Advani became the Home Minister, and unfortunately the same day, E.M.S. Nambudri Path, a towering leader of the CPIM, passed away. What did Vajpayee do? You know, he sent the very same day, the very same evening, he sent Advani ji to Kerala 
to participate in the funeral as a representative of Vajpayee's government. And at the funeral, Advaniji paid rich tribute to EMS Nambudri Park. While stating that we have ideological differences with the communists, nevertheless, we recognize and we respect all that was good in the Communist Party and, of course, in EMS Nambudri Park. Can you imagine something happening today? There is such vicious propaganda against the left by the right. Unfortunately, the same kind of propaganda that the party of Salim, Comrade Salim, indulged in against the right. So, friends, I believe that India is a land of uh, diversity, not just religious diversity, not just cultural diversity, but also ideological diversity. There is no monopoly for any particular ideology or any political party in India. Every party, every political ideology, left, right, center, everything has a place and everything has to be respected. And we need more and more cooperation amongst all these different ideologies. And for cooperation, we need dialogue. And I expect that this particular dialogue, as you very rightly said, constructive dialogue, so let there be a constructive dialogue between the left, right, center for the good of India. Thank you. Are those, in your view, empty platitudinous words? Or do you believe that what Sudhinder Ji is saying is correct? That today there has been an overbalance. It is actually the right that is demonizing the left. And can you imagine the time that Mr. Vajpayee sent Mr. Advani to a funeral of an opposition leader that wouldn't happen again here in the India of today. Tejasviji. Good evening, Rahul. Thank you so much for having me here. First of all, I want to make my position clear that when we use the word left and right here in the context of this debate, I do not subscribe to a vichardhara, a school of thought, that can be considered quote-unquote right in the sense of the term that is used in the West. My party and I, we represent a worldview that is native to this country. We can be broadly termed as non-left or to be more precise, the Bharatiya worldview. And this is something that has been native to this soil. I want to take a minute before I get to what Sudhindraji mentioned about funeral. Of course, I can very easily say how a left sympathizing Nehru dealt with uh, Sardar Patel and how uh, the Congress party and the left have dealt with the uh, fallen heroes, the national heroes from P.V. Narasimha Rao to all the great people. They didn't even find uh, a six by six place in Delhi to uh, uh, honorably uh, uh, lay them to rest. This is their legacy. So I do not want to uh, allow them a free space where they can lecture us on how we must be uh, respecting our uh, uh, national icons. But Rahul, just me, let me just take one minute to explain how the left has always, in the Indian political context, tried to a great extent even succeeded to demonize the right. You began this debate by using the word fascist. That is something that the left has always labeled the, the non-left in India as. However, if you look at the Indian uh, non-left Indian context, we have always derived inspiration from our native heroes, whether it is Swami Vivekananda or Sri Aurobindo or uh, Pandit Deendayar Upadhyay or Shama Prasad Mukherjee. Whereas it is the left which even today derives inspiration from foreign heroes like Marx, Pol Pot, Stalin, or uh, Mao. Second, till today, no BJP government has ever imposed emergency in the country. It is the left and the Indira Gandhi government where the left was a, a part of that imposed emergency in India. And they accuse the right or the Bharatiya worldview of imposing, of being fascists. They accuse the right. I'm using right again just because of the context of the debate. They accuse us of curbing freedom of expression. But I want to make a challenge here. 
Every single judgment delivered by the Indian High Courts and Supreme Courts has always, in the context of freedom of speech, has always been given during and because of the Congress governments or the left governments. They accuse the BJP of being divisive. They accuse us of propagating violence in politics. The lasting contribution of the left in India, in Kerala and in West Bengal is violent bloodshed politics that happens to grab our headlines even to this day. They claim themselves to be champions, self-appointed champions of freedom of speech and expression, but they are the innovators and progenitors of the cancel culture. If, they do not, if you do not agree with their worldview, you will not find space either in academia, media, or even in a drama play in a school. That is the nature of the cancel culture the left has always practiced, not just in India, around the world. Invariably, whether it is in, 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 throughout India's history, you will always find the left invariably aligned to forces which are inimical to India's interests. Whether it is Article 370 opposition, whether it is opposition to the CAA, whether it is opposition to the Ram Mandir movement, whether it is opposition to Triple Talaq, they have always opposed India's interests. Lastly, Rahul, using the patronage of the government up to 2014 and greatly during the initial decades of our independence, to suit their agenda, they whitewashed history, history in the country. Truth that had to be told to our young people was whitewashed because it did not suit their agenda. The history of the left in India has always been one that has sided with anti-national interests, with siding with forces that have always conspired to break India. They have always used violence as their first and last resort to further their agenda and their means. They have always used power of the state, the power of the force, to curb freedom of expression of those forces and those ideas which do not conform to their worldview. This has been the legacy of the left in India. They have accused us of crony capitalism. But if you understand, if you study the history of India, they have always stalled development in the name of sometimes human rights, in terms of tribal rights, sometimes in terms of environmental rights, kept the poor poor so that they could keep their careers intact and sell India as a poor nation so that they can enjoy their personal lives by collecting big checks from the Ford Foundation. This has been the legacy of the left in India. And if someone has to, some, if someone today has to accept the blame of demonizing the non-left the Indic worldview, the Bharatiya worldview in India, it is falsely, it is fully and fully at the threshold of the left, which has finally and thankfully been completely rejected by, unfortunately, the proletariat, the masses of the nation. Sudhinder ji and uh, Salim ji, let me come to you first. The question is, and this is a question that he would also perhaps want to think about, the left calls the BJP that doesn't describe itself as such as a right-wing Hindu nationalist party and then adds, like Sitaram Yachuri did and Brinda Karat did in a press conference a year or so, so ago, the word Hitlerian fascist. So to suggest that the left has not demonized the right would not be quite accurate. But more fundamentally, I want us to focus on one example here. Both Mr. L.K. Advani and Mr. Vajpai were admirers of Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. It was after all during their tenure that this portrait was installed in Parliament. And yet Savarkar, who is an icon to one particular political persuasion, is continuously by the left and by parties that are aligned to the Communist Party at different levels, describe him as an extract of a fascist worldview. How does this work? First of all, come to the topic. I found the topic was that demonizing the right. But what the speaker has just now said is demonizing the left. Why should left will demonize BJP or right? Demon itself is a mythical character, mythological character. 
and I believe or we believe in science, not mythology. They are replacing science with mythology. One. They found Mamta Banerjee as Durga. And they blamed CPM as Ashura. And now, Mamta Banerjee converted itself, as BJP is converting itself as Bhasma Sura. So you require a Mohini. What I am talking about is, we are not ashamed of our ideology. But the right is, that's even he himself is saying, I'm not right, some kind of right of the center. Always in Indian politics, pre-independence and post-independent India. It was left, right and center. Right has gained momentum because the center has moved inside. He is talking about he, uh, cultural nationalism. Before that, when BJP was formed, they just may not be knowing, in 1980, the ideology they talked about, Gandhian socialism. This is the cloak. With every five years, they have changed the cloak. What we are talking about is only just showing them the mirror. It's not demonizing, but BJP is dehumanizing, dehumanizing the Indian society. The word mob lynching came when? He's talking about Pol Pot. Before you joined politics, or you came on this earth, the communist world over was fighting Pol Pot. When you never knew about Pol Pot. You should know this. And you are talking about Hitler, you are talking about Mussolini. Why should we say? Now you are glorifying God's say. Earlier you were ashamed of. You are talking about Gandhi. Earlier you never thought, talked about Savarkar. Now you are talking about, because you don't have icons in the history. And we have, we have freedom fighters. We have people who suffered in Andaman. Who went to the gallows. We are proud of that, our legacy. And you are trying to hijack Bhartiyata. It's good that you are not talking about Hindutva or Hindu. Bhartiyata. And others have drawn you. From Buddha, Jain, Vedas, to Rabindranath Tagore, all have world view. And you have demonizing Nehru. You have demonizing Bollywood, which is the most acceptable face in the world of India. You have demonized Bengalis. You term them as Rohingya. You term them as ba ba Bangladeshis. Now in Bangalore, now in Gurgaon, now in Delhi, everywhere they are suffering. Who, who have demonized whom? Why should we demonize you? We are just only telling where you went wrong. You are not accepting the diversity that you talked about. Diversity. Sir, did Stalin and Mao, quick counter question, yes. that you have idealized and a large number of people from the left who appear on my show, and on Times Now, did they, did these two individuals idealize diversity that you talk about? Where were they? Yes. Marx. They? Marx. Stalin. Talk I'm talking about Stalin. The world. I'm talking about You're Stalin talking and about Mao. What, no, I'm talking about Marx. That's a Marxist. Why are you picking? Don't make this pick and choose. Oh. Mao did something good things, something bad things. That's China is to recognize Just that. something bad or, things. That, that China has already denounced that. It's their duty. We as Indian, we have to see that. You talk about Basudev Kutumbakam, and then you talk about Bharatiya. Our motto is Satta Meva Jayate. This is universal truth. Universal. Can, Munda Munda Can I ask Pushat? you another counter question? In 2021, yes. in West Bengal, in the elections, did you not have an alliance with the Indian Secular Front led by Abbas Siddiqui? who is a cleric, who has gone on record, sir. So from Mars you come to Abbas Siddiqui. No, no, I'm Good. talking about all these individuals. You're talking about Vasudeva yeah. and Kattu come and... Carry on, you have the freedom. No, no, I'm only asking you. These what? are contradictions. What's the question? You're talking about... This is Islamophobia. This is... The Congress didn't all want to share the stage, sir. All these Sant Samagam, so who second, are those? The Congress, sir, let's not be, let's not quarrel. Who are those? Over each other. Sadhu, Sant, Mahan. Sir, please, please, one second. Any one second. religious person. One talk second. About? Why did the Congress not want to share the stage with Abbas Siddiqui? Ask Congress. Because he said he was a hate monger. They have already demonized Rahul. They have already demonized Nehru. I just okay. take 30 seconds, friends. Uh,
In Salim Ji's response, we can dissect and analyze the classic communist at work. When he did not have an answer, he immediately labeled Rahul as Islamophobic. That is what the left does. They label you. So the fascist, that's the label. They are the masters at giving somebody certificates because they are the ones who are sitting on high thrones where they can patronize you. They certify whether you are an eminent historian or not. They decide if your version of history is the true history or not. They certify whether you are a fascist or not. They certify whether you are worthy of getting a Padma or not. Those this, who don't until have the masses truly spoke in 2014. Those who have studied history, not just that have, Rahul, have an history. Sir, okay, let's yes, 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 not talk over Vanka. each other. I just want to say this, Rahul. I am extremely happy today that a communist party speaker, a spokesman today, has quoted the Bhasma Sura, the Mohini, the Mundaka Upanishad, and everything more than the BJP spokesperson has done. And I think this is what. There's and no massive change that copyright. has happened today. Thank you no, so much. It's good that you should not claim copyright. Okay. One, one at a time. Copyright items. Dr. Ranganathan, you've heard uh, Mr. Muhammad Selim and his characterizations of the right. Though he insists that he is not demonizing the right, how do you respond? Uh, first of all, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on this panel with the fantastic panelists. And I take a little objection to uh, my sitting here. I wanted to sit next to the comrade because I am from JNU. And uh, I even wore a tie to celebrate the, this thing. And if, if there is left at only three places in India, it is Kerala, it is JNU, and it is the media. So, uh, <laughs> but to, to come back, Rahul, to the, the topic, the title of the topic itself is uh, right being uh, demonized is demonization of the, 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 the right left working, working for, for the right. Nothing is working for the left because the left doesn't work. <laughs> yes. I mean, I'm not reinventing the wheel here. This is the left's history for 125 years or 100 years. The, and uh, uh, with due respect to uh, Mr. Kulkarni, be always suspicious of the person who takes pride in the fact that for 15 years he was a communist and then for another 15 years he became, joined the BJP. It's like, You've seen that Phool or Kante Ajay Devgan, you know, straddling two scooters. His one leg is on one scooter, and the two scooters are progressively wearing opposite. And all you end up with, unfortunately, no, I don't want, but with groin injury. But the, the fact of the matter is that when you say right or left, Rahul, the labels have become so, I don't know, uh, fundamental to our psyche that we look at a person and before we even know his or her name or wanting to know, we want to know which ideology he or she may belong to. That person may be ideologically agnostic, but still we will force an ideology. So you would be left, you would be right, you would be this, you would be that, you would be trans, you would be LGBTQ plus T, M, I don't know how many other things have gotten into there. But labeling, I think this is a fact because in order to come back to this, you have to actually define, as Tejasvi rightly put it. Uh, I mean, I, I would be critical of Tejasvi in, uh, in a minute, uh, uh, you know, because he's right when he says he's not really right. But what is he? That is also a bit confusing because this government for the last eight years, let's be very serious, economically it has been left. It would make the communists proud. I will list out the policies, the, the leftist bent of this government. So it is not right in that sense. Sociologically, socially, you can say. But coming back to the left, it is the left that accuses the right of ignoring Muslim persecution around the world, but is absolutely silent when China has interned one and a half million Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps and is feeding them pork and making them drink alcohol. Complete silence. This is the left. So I'm not labeling them as left, I'm labeling them as hypocritical. So there is no right and left anymore. There is someone who is not hypocritical and honest, as he said, Satyamev Jayate, and then there is left, dishonest. It is the same left that accuses the left, uh, the right of being fascist, dictatorial, and yet remains, CPI remains the only party in the world ever to have publicly hailed the Tiananmen massacre in which 10,054 innocents were brutally murdered. This is not just me saying it, this is the CPI manifesto 
as well as Shashi Tharoor in this book, Pax Indica. So you can blame Shashi Tharoor. It is the left that accuses the right of furnishing mercy petitions. You, you mentioned Savarkar. They're always saying, oh, sorry, Savarkar, sorry. But they never mentioned that the founder of the Communist Party, Dange, wrote groveling mercy petitions to the British, saying that we will forever remain your obedient servants. Oh, sir, please release us from prison. Dange. So that's why you don't eulogize him. You should know that and but follow this. Do you mention? We do you mention hero. ever Dange? We don't put a V okay. in front of his name. So they know of their history, but they will not disclose it you to us. That is and them both. I did not interrupt you, Salimji. Please. Because the, the Magna Carta, I'm only halfway through your Magna Carta. Have patience. It is the left who accuses the right of not being patriotic, but in fact demoted its own Achutanandan when he erected blood donation camps in the wake of 1962 war, which were banned by the communists. He said, no, I'm going to erect blood donation camps, and they demoted him. This is the same left. It is the same left that accuses the right of stifling freedom of speech, but who banned Lajja? Who's banned so many writers? Who jailed editors? In Kerala right now, 120 people have been booked by the police, Kerala police, under the communists, for supposedly insulting the Chief Minister Vijayan. This is the same left that fights for freedom of speech and saying democracy is under threat. It is the same uh, left that actually accuses the right of ignoring atrocities against Dalits, but is completely silent on the Mari Chapi massacre where the left brutally murdered 10,000 Dalits, man, woman, and child. They never discussed that. So what is this left and right? And I'll tell you what the irony, what the tragedy is, that there is so much, so much for us, or the non-aligned, you can say, it's a very dirty word, non-aligned, but, you know, to criticize this government for, not demonize it, but criticize it so much. But the fact of the matter is that on the things that you want to criticize the government, the opposition is actually pro-government. All those policies that you want to criticize the government for, the left and the, the Congress, they support those policies. For example, public sector units. I recently uh, did a piece with, uh, co-wrote a piece with Karan Basin, an economist, and we found out we dug with great difficulty. There are 1,830 public sector units in this country, central and state. 450 of them are non-functional. 21% of our yearly allocated budget goes in propping up those public sector units. All that money goes to waste. But the left doesn't want privatization. The left supports the repealing of the farm laws, which would have actually catapulted us to a middle-income economy, because agriculture that supports 44% of our 515 million active labor force contributes only 12% to our GDP. The whole machinery from start to finish is totally archaic. But when the farm laws were repealed, who congratulated? Who said it is a victory? It was the Congress. And let me tell you the real tragedy here, why they never criticized the government. You had in the wake of Pulwama bombing when Pakistan killed 20 of our Jawans, our Indo-Pak trade was brought to zero. This government acted. Not only there, defense why it went and bombed Pakistan. But when China kills 20 of our soldiers in Galwan, what do we do? Our Indo-China trade is at the highest ever. We are importing 100 billion worth of goods from China and exporting 20 billion, it's 125 billion dollars. In three years, you could not shift. We call ourselves Atma Nirbar, Atma Nirbar. We are becoming more and more Nirbar on China. And it is the government of India report that says 87% of the goods that we source from China can be sourced cheaper from a third country. It has been two years, two and a half years since Galwan. What have we done? This is where you need to criticize the government. But all these policies are supported by the left. So what is right and what is left? At the end, at the end, I'm science ki taraf se. But Dr. Ranganathan, very quickly, let me come back to you. While we are talking about the demonization of uh, the right, let's not forget how the Prime Minister himself or the Union Home Minister have used terms like urban Maoists and Tukre Tukre gang to respond to the left or to attack the left. How do you explain that? So, in fact, the, the phrase urban maxes that's been attributed to Vivek Agnihotri was first used by a, a communist who wrote a biography for Mrinal Sen and his films. It was also part of an affidavit. 
Yes. In the Supreme Court filed by the UPA government. Correct, 2013. But Just like love jihad, right. love jihad phrase was not used by the BJP, first by the Kerala High Court. So, these that labels... that doesn't make it right. Yeah. That doesn't make it right. That doesn't make it right, but it is the truth. There are urban naxals. So then they will say, Mr. Sudhindra Kulkarni or Mr. Mr. Selim will say, to well, to then the Labour Fascists is they're also right. I'm finding out one person who did not defend his alma mater. Now you're showing red tie when in jail he was demonized. Where you there? I don't think he got the sarcasm of it, but sir, I am on the other side of the iron curtain in JNU. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the fact okay. of the matter is these labels as, uh, you know, our erudite panelists would consider, they are the easiest thing to throw. And uh, can they prove me wrong on the five things I have said that you should be criticizing this government for, for its policies? But you aren't because you support this government on these archaic things of let's have public sector stake, let us not change any farm laws, let us you know keep the Indo-China trade the same. The fact of the matter is there is a reason why the communist symbol is what it is for 100 years, hammer and sickle. They want us to keep using those tools. Okay, uh, Mr. Kulkarni, let's just quickly get back to this. Please explain. There is an attempt at reviving an Indic worldview, to quote, to quote my friend here, Member of Parliament, Mr. Surya. I just want to ask you, when the Prime Minister goes to Kedarnath or attends ceremonies for the Kashvi Vishwanath Temple, etc., etc., he is dismissed as a Hindu nationalist. When he pays tribute to Veer Sabarkar, he's dismissed as someone who's subscribing to a fascist, exclusivist worldview. When RSS chief Mohan Bhagwat says, we accept Akbar, but not Aurangzeb, he's called an Islamophobe. How does this work? Because you've been, as you have yourself said, in the BJP. Now, would you say that when RSS chief Mohan Bhagwat picks one Mughal over the other, he's an Islamophobe, or he is demonizing Muslims and their heritage. Mm. Do you think that Aurangzeb belongs to the same bracket as Akbar? Rahulji, before I come to your question, let me respond to this whole uh, mention of urban Naxal. Today, today, one alleged urban Naxal has been given bail by the highest court, the Supreme Court, Anand Teltumde, hmm? who was incarcerated for months together. And this is what is happening to more and more and more people in India without trial. They have been pushed into prison. But sir, what is the no, point? Because my one, point is one this. Hindu terrorist, no, in your I, words, a Hindu terrorist, no, Sahadvi Pragya was also given bail. No, therefore, I am saying that... Uh, you very rightly said that even the use of the word urban naxal by the highest leaders of this country is objectionable. They may be prime minister and the home minister of India, but it is absolutely unacceptable that Indians are kept in jail for months, for years, without trial. It's a blot on our democracy, point number one. Now coming to, you know, you may lampoon me for being uh, proud of the fact that I belong to both the left and the right. But... I want to reiterate that India needs what is good in right, what is good in left. I am not one of those who demonizes either this or that. And let the people on the right, on the BJP, know that they are not going to be in power forever. No, but you are not answering Wait. my question, sir. No, Please. I because it's important to know These are labels. that power is transitory. Okay. You know a country like but Brazil? That's a different issue. Just one moment. You know a country it like Brazil? Left to right or right Lulu. Lulu. Okay. No, Lula. You know, you know, Lula, yes. you know, you know a, a person like Bolsonaro? Yeah. Was he in power forever? That tells you that even those who are in power are not going to be in power forever. India comes first, left and right, they come why, and go. No, no, no. But One. Sir, no, no. Is that why you change the parties? Please answer my question. Please answer my question. About Indic. Yeah. Indic no, no. worldview. I, I I'm, listen I'm very carefully. About, sir, you were part of the BJP. RSS Chief Mohan Bhagwat says, now I don't know how to characterize him, because when he makes this distinction between Akbar and Aurangzeb, 
immediately he goes on to becoming an Islamophobe, which was a term, a label thrown at me right now. Do you think both belong to the same bracket? And if not, then do you think it's unfair of the left on this particular point to label Mohan Bhagwat an Islamophobe? It's a simple question. It is wrong. It is wrong on the part of the left to criticize Mohan Bhagwat. I have admired Mohan Bhagwat. I have written in praise of Dr. Mohan Bhagwat for his outreach to Muslims, which is what India needs today. For time and again, the RSS chief has been trying to build better relations with the Muslim community, and I want the Muslim community to respond positively to what Dr. Mohan Bhagwat has been so doing. So I don't call Muslims. Dr. Mohan Bhagwat a fascist, a terrorist, you know, these or are labels the, that must be given up. Or part of the larger Muslim Brotherhood, as Rahul Gandhi described the RSS, that it was like the Muslim Brotherhood. Rahul Did Gandhi say? is wrong in this. Rahul Gandhi is wrong in blanket criticism of the RSS. Even though I support his Bharat Jodo Yatra, his blanket criticism of the RSS is wrong. RSS is a part of Indian social, political, ideological, cultural reality. And we must build bridges with the RSS, even though what is wrong in the RSS also must be corrected. Now, let me, let, I, I must point out one, you know, you asked me a question about Indic worldview. Yes. Tejasvi Surya, talking about the Indic worldview, he took the name of Swami Vivekananda. He took the name of Aurobindo, of course, great philosophers, great social reformers. But he omitted, and I'm sure he omitted it deliberately, the name of Mahatma Gandhi, the greatest Bharatiya leader of modern times. Why? Because he does not believe in what Mahatma Gandhi stood for. And Mahatma Gandhi stood for Hindu-Muslim unity. He paid with his life for Hindu-Muslim unity. And unfortunately, the assassin of Mahatma Gandhi is being celebrated, idolized by a section of the the Hindutva Parivar. Now, friends, when we talk of Bharatiyata, Bharatiya worldview, let's remember that Bharat, India, is a multi-religious nation. It was, it always will be. And therefore, Muhammad and Salim, Muhammad Salim are as much part of Bharat as Sudhindra Kulkarni or Tejasvi Surya. But unfortunately, today's BJP is neglecting this. And I but compliment Dr. BJP, Mohan Bhagwat. But you I yourself? compliment Mohan Bhagwat for teaching some good lessons to the BJP leaders. Rahul. Okay, there's I a must, contradiction I here because I thought the BJP Rahul, imbibes I must, a lot from the worldview of the RSS. So can you explain this? Well, it's okay, well but before I get more. there, I must They're truly just concede. taking my 30 seconds away. I must okay. truly concede that uh, Sudhindra Kulkarni ji is a true visionary. He is... Uh, uh, balancing his opinions in such a way that uh, whichever government comes to power tomorrow, he is always safe. So, you know, while he criticizes the RSS in the same breath, he also praises Rahul Gandhi. It is a fine knack that of a very uh, a minuscule minority of the intellectual class in India has mastered. So, um, that's something that we saw in great display today. Having said that, Rahul, uh, this whole... Ganga, Yamuna, Thaisib, the uh, Salim, Muhammad, Sudhindra, Kulkarni, Surya, everybody. These are all things that have been uh, lectured ad nauseum from the last 70 years. We have always seen that in India, secularism as practiced by the left and as patronized by the Congress party has always been a one-way street. Where it is always the Hindu who has always gave his way, he is the Hindu who has always compromised and it has never been a two-way street. The moment the Hindu asks for equitable rights, the moment the Hindu asks for equal treatment before the law, he is termed, labeled as Brahminical, patriarchal, fascist, what not. And that's the end of the debate. That was how this was conducted until 2014, until the masses truly spoke up, which is what they are unable to digest today. Because all these years, they governed and they ruled in the name of the masses, and they enrich themselves at the cost of the masses. But today, the masses are speaking in unison, and it is truly the rule of the masses which they cannot digest. 
And just to say, the greatest warning, the greatest warning that any Indian intellectual gave to the people of this country about the communists was from Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar himself. And he used the Constituent Assembly itself as the pedestal to speak and warn the people about the nature, the true nature of the socialists and the communists. He said if there is a threat that may come tomorrow to the country's freedom, the country's constitution, it will be from this sector, the communists. This is not me speaking. This is Baba Sahib Ambedkar's words in the Constituent Assembly. So from then till now, their actions and their words have always been inimical to India's interests. What, howsoever uh, they may like to cloak it was. You wanted to yeah, make no, a point. Just a couple of points to Mr. Kulkarni. I, I think what, what he praises, I'm, I'm quite shocked and appalled actually, the kind of things that he's saying that are praiseworthy. I'll they just take two examples. I, it is certainly not praiseworthy for uh, someone to say that I, I really admire Mr. Bhagwat for reaching out to Muslims. I'm sorry, what is this reaching out? And if, if anyone needs to be reaching out, it is the Hindus of the country. I can give you a list of, I, 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 you know, Rahul, on your debate, when we had this debate of Hindus have been reduced to second class citizens, and then progressively, I have now a list where Hindus are not second class citizens, they are eighth class citizens. And this government is not just partly, but kind of wholly responsible for keeping them as eight class citizens. If I were to ask Mr. Salim very simple yes or no question, would he agree that the government take control of the mosques? Of course he will say no. But including this government is controlling Hindu temples, earning lakhs and lakhs of crores of that is legitimately Hindu temple property and that of Hindus. There are so many other examples, places of worship act, the work of 1995, the Kashmiri Hindus not being rehabilitated back to Kashmir. So it is the Hindus that need reaching out to, not the Muslims, I'm sorry. So let's get those facts right. And secondly, when he says that the greatest person who ever walked the earth was Mahatma Gandhi and I mean, I, this is just appalling. So let me end with this. You know, I don't need to criticize or lampoon the great Mahatma. I will just use his own words. This is what he said while preaching to those affected by the pre-partition Hindu-Muslim violence. And I'm quoting from his own works, Mahatma Gandhi's. And Mr. Kulkarni would know because he has written a book on Mahatma Gandhi. Quote, Hindus should not harbor anger in their hearts against Muslims even if the latter wanted to destroy them. Even if the Muslims want to kill us all. We should face death bravely. If they established their rule after killing all Hindus, we would be ushering in a new world by sacrificing our lives. We shall be ushering in a new India. So the gentleman who is calling the greatest man who walked the earth wouldn't have been there to utter these words because the Muslims would have killed us all and he would have been happily writing his biography. A quick response to Hindraji to what Dr. Anand Ranganathan has said and then a question that I would like to frame. Unfortunately, this has become uh, part of the ideological uh, demonization of Mahatma Gandhi these days, that he was a Muslim appeaser, all that. But you please take the trouble of uh, looking back at the life of Mahatma Gandhi in its totality. So did he say this he or not? You know, but you don't take some words. He has been equally critical of Muslim communalism. There comes context. No. Therefore, context Shall I tell is you important. About his quotes about Mopla riots, when he said the Hindus were responsible for their own massacre. What are you talking about? And you know, it's not just me My. criticizing Mahatma Gandhi. Ambedkar, Ambedkar said, no, no, I will no, not no, allow Mahatma Gandhi to say the things he said okay. about Mopla riots. Rahul, please read Rahul, some Rahul, history. Rahul. It is embarrassing for a scientist to teach someone else history. They're having a problem. You know, Mahatma Gandhi was a devout Hindu and he was an Indian who believed in inclusive India. Inclusive for every section of Indian society, every religion, every caste living in harmony. Now, I don't want to go into uh, the whole uh, life of, and legacy of Mahatma Gandhi. But demonizing Mahatma Gandhi, unfortunately, has become part of the demonizer, demonizing of 
I won't say left, he was not left, he was not right, he was Indian, he was humanist. But demonizing of Mahatma Gandhi, unfortunately, has become core of the ideological discourse by not everyone in the BJP. Quoting I know, Mahatma Gandhi is demonizing him. Quoting Darwin would be from original speech demonizing and let not, I'm not just talking, Rahul, just 30 seconds. I don't want to just talk about Hindu Mahatma Muslim, Gandhi, Mr. Mr. Pilkani, it please. Is, allow I, I did not interrupt allow you when me. you were talking. Okay. One, second, one second. I did not one interrupt second. you. I want to quote so I regard from... Mahatma Gandhi as the father of the nation. Mahatma Gandhi is the greatest Indian born in modern times and also the greatest Hindu. He was a devout Hindu. Now, I don't want to get into Mahatma Gandhi debate in this. Let me only say this, that left or right, we have to learn to live together in this country. No, so if that is the case, so I, I want then to there are just 30 seconds. This time, you <laughs> owe me. Uh, Sudhinder ji, we have talked about Mahatma Gandhi. There are many contributors to the freedom struggle. We forget. Let me finish, sir. There's, for a particular persuasion, an ideological persuasion, Veer Savarkar, who also contributed. He went to jail. He jumped out of a boat, daring the authorities, risking his life, which he actually paid for, to get a message across. He also fought a cause, but he's called a coward. Yet, Mr. Vajpayee and Mr. L.K. Advani wanted to honor him in Parliament. Are we being selective again on the issue of our icons. Yes, we are selective. So we are intolerant. When you talk about freedom fighters, we are Mr. selective. Gandhiji, I thought you were talking about Bhagat Singh. We are selective. You brought in Vir Savarkar. We are selective. Talk about freedom fighters. And why should we discuss no, no. about Why, one second. why should there be a cancel culture? This side why of should someone icon else's icon? So you utter the name of Bhagat Singh. Why should someone so else's icon not, not be mentioned? Or you put him as a freedom fighter? Can't we? Can't we respect Besides, uh, all the contributions of all our freedom fighters equally? Is there a problem? Yes, there is a problem, Rahul, and I'll tell you what the problem is, because according to the latest book by Vikram Sampat, who you deliberated yesterday, Mr. Joshi of the CPI actively colluded with the British and gave away the whereabouts of INA members and Subhash Bose. So the collaborators were actually the communists. So they obviously have a problem when you talk about Veer Savarkar, but just to come back to this issue of, I don't want to talk about Mahatma Gandhi in the context of just Hindu-Muslim. I am quoting him. I am not demonizing him. Let me quote him away from Hindu Muslim, Ganga Jamna Tazeeb. This is Gandhi's appeal to Britons on the eve of Battle of Britain and Nazi invasion in 1940, when Britain faced the greatest threat. And I quote him, fight Nazism without arms. Invite her Hitler to take possession of your island. And if he refuses to give a free passage out, allow yourself man, woman and child to be slaughtered. This is the greatest man who walked the earth. Well, viewers, that greatest man who said he's the greatest man to walk on peace of work was one of the greatest scientists, Albert Einstein. So, Einstein cannot be wrong. Okay. We've had a spirited debate. I anticipated this. Viewers, at the end of the day, I do agree that labels have become very convenient. They're a convenient tool to sweep a lot under the carpet and keep a lot out of the conversation. And that's really restrictive and sad. At least we made a beginning here. We've had some exchanges not marked by complete breakdown of order that we have seen in other debates. And let's hope that these conversations can keep continuing. I leave it at this. Thank you. Thank you.